Well, good morning to all. Good to see you. As uh, we're gathering for worship and you're joining us online, we invite you to mark in the comments uh, your attendance. Uh, let us know where you're from. Let us know how much snow you got last night. Uh, we were comparing stories this morning. Uh, glad to say that we didn't get impacted by as much snow as was predicted, uh, but uh, glad that uh, we're able to worship together this morning. As uh, we gather and you see people's comments, feel free to comment on others to say it's great to see you. Uh, we try to encourage an online community as we're doing the remote services during this time, uh, particularly as we see uh, so many high number of cases of COVID in our community. Uh, we're encouraging our online worship community this way. Um, a few announcements to uh, bring us together. Uh, this week is our program week. And so if you're part of our care team, you're uh, part of our uh, worship team. Uh, this week we will be meeting. And so I invite you to uh, connect. Uh, if you would like to be a part of either of those teams, that's fine. Just uh, let me know and we'd be glad to invite you to be a part of that. Always glad to have new input about what we do in terms of how we care for the church and how we worship the Lord together. Uh, if you have some suggestions, uh, please uh, participate in that as well. Uh, also note that part of this is that uh, as a church, we are uh, reinitializing our shepherding teams and so this week during our care meeting, we'll be spending some time talking with what does it mean for us to help each other, to be shepherds to one another and caring uh, for each other. And so note that that's happening as part of our care meeting this week. Uh, one other announcement uh, is just recognizing that uh, there are opportunities for small groups and uh, the best way to grow in your faith is to have a chance to check in with one another. Uh, there are opportunities that you'll see on our website that will list the various times for when we do those uh, meetings. We have an online meeting on Tuesday night and we have in-person meetings at other times. I uh, just invite you to go to the Grow tab on our website and you'll find those opportunities there. Uh, also, knowing that in this time, particularly when we're remote, uh, we are encouraging the passing of the peace, uh, sharing online, just response to a question. And uh, so something I might put out there as a question is, what is something new that you have tried in the last two years? And uh, so two years, it's about, as, well, guess what? We're celebrating about two years of this COVID thing. So sometime in this last two years, what is something that you've tried new? Uh, let you think about that for a minute. I think I've mentioned before that I picked up Duolingo French. I haven't really made any real progress. I've just continued to be a part of that or trying it for the last two years. So, yo no parle français, you know, work that out. <laughs> so, uh, what are the things that we try that are new? Yeah. Okay, mine is learning more about the computer. Okay, learning the computer. The yeah. I think you got it. Well, and for those who are watching online, I imagine that two years ago, we had no imagination about having worship online. And for a lot of people figuring out how to pick up a Facebook uh, video feed was a brand new idea to begin with. So that's, that's right on point. A lot, of, a lot of new things happening there. And if this is new, please comment on that as well. Others, uh, things that have been new for you in the last two years that you had to start new. Yeah. Oh, learning Italian on Duolingo. Okay, so parlez-vous français? No, it's, <laughs> so the only difference is the, uh, the, the hand gestures. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, others uh, things you want to, to share uh, something that you've knew that's tried. Well, again, I invite you to mark those comments online and to uh, respond to others as they share of what's going on in their life as well. I'm going to invite Anne Foley to come forward and uh, begin our time of prayer with our opening prayer together. Good morning. Please join me in the opening prayer. Gracious God, we come to you with day, seeking your guidance and strength. You have called us to ministries for which we feel inadequate. Help us to understand that it is your love that will support and sustain our efforts. Give us the courage to place our trust in your abiding presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to sing with us our opening hymn, Come and Find the Quiet Sunder.
Today's scripture reading is from Luke 5, verses 33 to 39. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. should be seated. Well, it's great to see you online, and for those of you who are part of our worship group here in person, uh, we are in a series in which we're talking about what does it mean for us to follow Jesus, and we've been hearing the stories of Jesus' life, uh, listening to his teaching, and considering for ourselves how do we live that out. Uh, Again, just another shameless plug for us to connect with our small groups. Our small groups are taking a deeper dive into some of the teachings of Jesus and asking some of the deeper questions of how do we really live that out. And really the best way to follow in our faith is to ask one another to hold us accountable to what we hear the Spirit of God telling us to do and to be a part of our own life. And so again, to follow Jesus, I want to encourage us to do that in accountability with other believers. But today we hear an interesting story where Jesus has been with his disciples and they are perhaps going through another town and Jesus is doing his teaching deal. And some of the teachers of the law, some of the observers of what's going on, come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, you're kind of (laughs) different. You're you're not like the other uh, teachers, the religious leaders. You're not even like John the Baptist. We recognize that those other groups They do all kinds of interesting religious practices. They fast and they pray, but we noticed that your disciples don't do any of that. We're trying to figure out why. You know, are are you guys not religious enough? You know, the, the question, the religious test for Jesus and his disciples, are you religious enough for us? Are you a holy enough group? And Jesus has a really interesting response to them in that he tells them that they cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them. Essentially, if you're going to a party, you should expect to enjoy yourself at the party. You should enjoy the guests that are there. And if you're fasting and you're hiding out in a a seclusion or silence, it's not a part of being that party gathering of Jesus and his disciples. He said, we are doing something new. We're part of something that God is doing in a brand new way. And so we're going to unpack that story a little bit. We recognize that Jesus gives two illustrations of what this would mean. He first talks about a garment. And he says, you know, if you have an older garment that has been torn, and I suppose we're, you know, as I was hearing people come in, you know, the, our winter clothes that we pull out, and we finally pull back on when it's uh, snowy out. Oh, we noticed that, well, last year I hadn't quite fixed that pocket or something. You know, I've got my older system going on. That you wouldn't go out and buy a brand new garment or get some new fabric and then tear it apart to fix your old garment. Why? Well, because it would ruin the new garment if you were to take a piece out of that and you realize that it's really hard to match that's the, the older garment together. And so the emphasis of that particular parable is to recognize that if you're doing something new, you're not going to uh, tear it apart in order to try to shove it into the old patterns, the way things have been. You're going to want the new thing to stand out on its own. You want to wear the new thing, you'd probably even parade it around town saying, look at my new threads, I look pretty good, right? So, you know, you're not going to tear apart your new garment in order to fit it into what's old. 
In a similar way, he talks about wine, and, and I don't know if anyone out here makes wine. In the Methodist church, we typically discourage people from making too much wine. Uh, but, you know, in Jesus in his day, that was a thing. And so, you know, the idea was that if you have old wine skins, what would happen, of course, is that during the process of fermentation, the gases build up in that wine skin, and it stretches the skin of that wine skin to an extent that it's, it's not going to shrink back. And so when you pour in your new wine into the new wine skins, they kind of grow together. Uh, the fermentation process pushes out the skin of the wine skin. And then once the wine is out, it's, it's basically it's stretched as much as it's going to stretch. You know, we think of some of our skin. It's stretched as much as it's going to stretch, right? And, and, and Jesus is saying, you're not then going to put new wine into old wine skins because when the new wine is doing its process of fermentation and, and the gases are growing, uh, it's going to bust the wine skin. And now both the wine and the wine skin are ruined. And you're not going to have anything to do with that anymore. And again, Jesus is emphasizing the point that if you're doing something new, you're not going to try to push it into old patterns. You're not going to try to do the old thing in a new way because the old thing has already gone through the experience of life. It's already stretched as much as it's going to stretch. And you can't try to expect the, the new thing to comply with the old patterns. And you can't expect the, the things that are the old to somehow absorb the adjustments that are needed for the new. To try to put the two together makes no sense. And so Jesus tells these uh, stories as a way for helping us to understand that indeed Jesus stepping into our world was inviting people into a new relationship with God. Something that the world had not seen before. It was different in a number of different ways, but first off was recognized that we, when Jesus walked on the earth with his disciples, the world had never seen God in the flesh. To understand what that looked like, for Jesus to walk the streets and speak the very words of God, to heal people with the authority and the power of the Almighty, was something the world had never seen before. And so, of course, people were scratching their heads wondering, what, how do we make sense of this new thing that Jesus is doing? And so we recognize there is a contrast, and I'm going to put up here some slides about a contrast between the way things had been and the, the newness of what Jesus was calling us to. And the first has to do with religious observances. You know, the Jewish law had a bunch of laws in order to what? Help people live according to what they understood God's law expected of them. And if you lived according to the observances, that is, you had the right kind of prayers, you had the right kind of times of fasting, you had these times of re observing different religious festivals, if you did that right, then you might be able to feel good about your religious observance. And you said, I've done everything I can do to be right with God. But the thing is, what it made you right with is made you right with your observance. Your religious ritual observance was all that you could show for it. But Jesus was saying to the Pharisees and those in the crowd who were asking is it's, it's not about this religious outward observance that is important. It's about this relationship. Because Jesus was saying, I am the bridegroom. I am with my disciples and they are experiencing a relationship with me. And that is so much better than figuring out whether or not they can do all the right rituals and observances. And Jesus is essentially saying this new religion, this new vehicle for God's truth, is not about being able to check off a list of do's and don'ts in terms of religious traditions and religious observances, but it's about recognizing a relationship that is open to all people to experience a relationship with God. I mentioned this last week, and I'll probably say it a thousand times more, in that when we are talking about helping people connect with God, we are not trying to help people get connected with a religious institution. And I think this is important for us to get a hold of, because too often when we talk about what we do as a church, we talk about trying to grow the church. Doesn't matter how much orange juice the church drinks, it's not going to get any bigger. Right? The institution is the institution. But what Jesus is inviting people to isn't some sort of set of religious observances, but instead is into a relationship with God Almighty. I think often we find ourselves in those conversations with people where they might know that we are religious people or that we're Christians or whatever it is. And they say, well, you know, I've tried those things. I grew up with church. I went to Sunday school or I hear so often, well, I was baptized in the Methodist church, but then and who knows what else comes after that. 
And what they're recognizing is that religious tradition didn't do it for them. The truth is that religious traditions and observances, as good as they might be, have no power on their own. They're absolutely useless in our lives, except for the power of God. Religious traditions hopefully open our hearts to being open to God infiltrating into our lives. When we fast, it isn't because somehow I've checked off a list and said, because I fasted the right way, because I have not eaten food or drunk water or whatever it is I'm fasting from, now somehow that is somehow making me a better person. We fast because we recognize this is an opportunity for me to focus my heart in hearing the heart of God, to be open to what the Spirit of God might be saying in my life. It's about, again, rekindling that relationship, because while religious observance has no power to transform our lives, there is one who does, and that is Jesus. Jesus himself, the power of God Almighty, walking in our lives, has the power to change who we are, to bring new life out of what is dead, to bring into our lives life and power and vibrancy in places that feel as if they've been abandoned and forgotten. God is able to do a new thing, even when everything else seems to have passed away. And so as Jesus is giving this contrast about how he and his disciples are not fasting and praying in the same way that the Pharisees and the the Sadducees do, he's not saying that they will never fast or that they will never pray. But he's saying that what they have in front of them, that relationship that they have right now is so much better we, we can't just help but remember that, that relationship between Mary and Martha. You know, Mary was there by the feet of Jesus, and she was hanging out with Jesus and listening to Jesus' teaching, and she was excited about what Jesus was teaching. And of course, Mary's sister Martha is busying herself in the kitchen, making sure that everything is right. And, and I just thank God for all the Marthas in the world who are making sure that the, you know, all the food is happening, that potluck is happening. I, you know, I thank God for that. But at the end of the day, Martha comes and says to Jesus, Jesus, why is it that you haven't told my sister to help me out in the kitchen? This is the pastor's paraphrase, right? I think it fits, though. And Jesus says, because your sister has chosen this relationship, which is much better than simply doing the religious duties. And it is possible to do our religious duties out of love for God, and those might even bring us closer to God. But if we think that those religious duties on their own have any power to transform our lives, we're fooling ourselves. Because God calls us first into an intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that is what transforms our lives. There is where we find the power. There is where we find the life. We also recognize that this old system of religious uh, observances in Jesus' day was basically being led by some really self-righteous leaders. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the Pharisees had set up not just the, the laws of Moses, there's like 318 laws of Moses, but they had set up a whole set of laws apart, way around those laws to make sure you could never even possibly touch the laws that Moses had actually put out for the people. And so they were known as the bleeding Pharisees. They would walk through the town looking higher than everyone else, and they were called the bleeding Pharisees because they might even bump their head into the walls because they were so busy looking up upward to God or in their prayer books that they didn't see where they were going. They were so focused on their own righteousness that they missed the heart of God for others. They missed what it was, what God was calling them to be about, the people whom God loved. And so when Jesus was with the disciples, the thing that the Pharisees, you know, drove them nuts about Jesus was he kept hanging out with these known sinners The people who, people already, you know, who's the sinner in our community? Oh, well, we know those people, right? Those were the people that Jesus hung out with. And Jesus says, those are the people whom God is bringing into the kingdom of God, leaving you in the dust. And they're like, hey, haven't you seen how righteous we are? Haven't you seen how cool we are? And Jesus says, all your righteousness is going to hell. Thank you very much. What is required is us to have the heart of God to reach the lost and the broken. Because when we want to connect and experience the power of transformation and vitality in, in life, we need to be a part of what God is doing. And not, not just trying to look good on the outside, to, but to truly be honest about our own failures. I think anyone who's been a part of a 12-step step group or an AA group can tell you the one thing that is a part of those groups that the church often misses is just open honesty. 
about our struggles. Hey, my life is a mess. I lost my job last week because I was high. I lost my job last week because my wife and I got an argument and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I kicked the dog and next thing you know, I, I lost my job. You know, just the dirt honesty of life. It, what happens too often in our, you know, self-righteous religious circles is that we spend so much time trying to look good to each other that we don't allow for the Holy Spirit to do the true healing work that requires an open honesty about our hurts, our pains, and our struggles. Again, just another promotion out there is that being a part of a small group is an opportunity to say, guys, you know, I, I know in our worship service together, well, now during COVID, during the online worship service, I can always look good in my own room. But if I were really honest, I'm struggling with doubt. I'm really having a hard time with my isolation in this COVID time. I'm really having a hard time just making sense of my relationships with my spouse or with my kids because they're driving me nuts. Though that self-awareness and that humility is exactly what Jesus calls us to. Not about trying to look good on the outside, but being open. Allow that shell, that hard shell that we try to purport to that mask to be open so that God can do his work of healing deep inside of us. We also recognize that, that religious systems work on fear. I, I was thinking of a quote from Benjamin Franklin talking about churches, and he was saying, you know, churches seem to operate in fear and, and, and guilt, and if you don't have any fear and guilt, they'll make sure you have it. <laughs> that was sort of the, the whole operation of what makes religion work, is, is a sense of fear and the need to somehow get right with God to get the forgiveness so you can then feel guilty again, so you can keep coming back each week. You know, have you said your confessions this week? Good. Okay, then come back to the priest to get your confessions done, Right. And that just seems to be this ongoing experience. I, I talk with so many people who talk about how growing up, the one thing that they remember about their religious experience with the church was being afraid of the priest or being afraid of God, that somehow God knew what you were doing in the dark and he's going to get you, right? He knew what you did. Jesus replaces this fear with love. Why? Jesus says this to the disciples. God demonstrates his love in this, that he sent his one and only son so that no one will perish but have eternal life. He turns that fear on its head and says, God is not waiting for the opportunity to punish you. God's waiting for the opportunity to embrace you. Jesus went to the streets, to those who were down and out, not because he wanted them to fear God, but he wanted them to know of God's heart and God's love how they would respond to God's compassion. I think in our own hearts, maybe we need to ask that question, what is it that's motivating my religious behavior? Do I listen to religious words or to sermons or come to church because I'm afraid that if I don't, I'm going to hell? Or that somehow something bad's gonna happen to me, some sort of weird cosmic bad karma is gonna hit me? Am I gonna run over a cat with my car instead of doing what I know God would want me to be a part of? Or is it that I recognize that I need this relationship that is being offered to me by God. And that when, when, I, when I'm distanced from that relationship from God, I recognize I feel empty inside. And that I, I need that connection. I need that fulfillment of God's love in my life. In order for that, I can just find my strength for day to day. Because it is there in that quiet center of the Spirit of God that I feel myself restored. I feel my energies renewed. I find my mind thinking on new things, and I'm able to overcome those things which I feel are oppressing me. There is no way that fear could ever relieve our burden in the same way that God's love breaks through the whole fog of what fear would put upon us. Amen. amen. I hear an amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so we recognize that this is what God calls us to, is a new relationship of love and not of fear. Again, I've mentioned that in the old system was a system of law, and we talked about how there was laws around it. Somebody asked me recently, you know, where is the law in the Old Testament that you couldn't push the elevator button in Israel? <laughs> because there is a law in Israel that on the Sabbath day, you cannot push a button. You cannot drive yourself around town or do any of these things. And I said, well, truthfully, there were no elevators in Jesus' day. So no, there was nothing in the law. And Moses, even before that, had no elevators. And so it's definitely not something that was written. But again, it was this boundary line that had been written by the religious leaders to keep people away from breaking that law, which was, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. You're supposed to give yourself a day of rest. 
Now, Jesus often had these controversies with the religious leaders about all of their piety, and particularly on the Sabbath day, and we'll talk about this in another sermon, but, but Jesus spent a lot of his time doing work on the Sabbath. He healed a lot of people on the Sabbath, and eventually he said, I am indeed the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, the rest was made so that people could rest. Men or people were not made to rest. We got this whole thing backwards. And so thinking about legalistic systems and following the law as some sort of, again, a checklist for righteousness misses the whole point because instead of following the law as to knowing what God would call us to, God invites us to know of his spirit and to be led by God's spirit. I think of how in Galatians, it gives this wonderful list in Galatians 5. It says, you know, here it is, the work of the human uh, sinful nature is obvious. And it talks about hatred and discord and and all these sorts of things, jealousy and strife and, and all these sorts of lists of things that happen when we're living out of our own human flesh. And when we're living out of our own human flesh, we hear the legalistic code, well, you shouldn't do those things. And we find ourselves in this ongoing war, trying to overcome in our own nature the things that we in our nature want to do. And so we are in this endless battle trying to overcome our sinful nature and guess what we always lose but then he says but the fruit of the spirit and i think about fruit fruit doesn't have to work at it fruit is a natural result of what's happening in the soil as it's connected with its source it says but the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and self-control. Those come naturally from a connection with the source of life that comes to us through the Holy Spirit himself, and that we experience that new relationship with the Spirit, and as we find ourselves connected with that source, new fruit begins to exhibit in our lives, sometimes in surprising ways. We're like, today I woke up, and I was joyful, and I don't know why. Today, I, I was moved to call my neighbor and to let them know of, my, of how I was thinking about them. And so I wanted to go spend some coffee, attend with coffee with them or sit with them because I wanted them to know of my love. And I don't know why. The Spirit moves in unforeseen ways, continuing to fuse the life together of our lives with the will of God. Let thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we see that happen in our life, not because we're trying to be right regarding to a law, but because we allow for the Spirit of God to infuse our mind and our actions in new and unforeseen ways. And there's not a checklist for that. There's not a, oh, today I've got to do these three things, but it's simply because we're listening for what the Spirit of God would call us to. At that end of that section in Galatians, it says, and against these things of the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law. You can love your neighbor to the nth degree, and no one's ever going to arrest you for it, by the way, right? You can be joyful to the nth degree, you can be peaceful to the nth degree, and there's never going to be a law saying you can't do that. So I invite us to just be a little more creative in the way we do these things, to be a little more creative in our care and our compassion towards others. I think that's part of what that new vehicle of God's people, his church, looks like, is that we act in strange ways to the world. When the world talks about division and hatred and uncertainty and suspicion towards your neighbor, we say, but I love you. You might not be sure of my motives, but that's okay. I'm still going to embrace you with my love. I know that you had a loss in your family, so I'm going to bring you some lasagna because I love you. And you might have three others in your fridge, but that's okay. I still love you. I'm going to act in ways that are God-led, not because I feel like I have to, but because this is what God calls me to. And finally, we talk about the difference between institutional and, you know, the institution would say what we're really trying to do is we're really just trying to get more butts in the seat. We need to increase our budget. We need to do what we can as a church to grow our institution. And it seemed like the mindset of the Pharisees was making sure that they had this nice little line around who the religious people were and keeping out those who were not religious enough. You know, it's interesting in, in coming in contact with the Northeast out here, there are some churches that have the mindset that the reason that the rest of the world isn't coming to know Jesus is because, well, they're just not holy enough. And if they really got a hold of the holiness of God, then they'd be good church people like the rest of us. The crazy thing is that's never going to happen. 
And that somehow in our mindset as a church, we think, well, and when people really come to know Jesus, they're going to want to be part of our finance committee. Or maybe they want to be a part of our, you know, all sorts of council meetings that we have, because that's real good religious stuff. That's all institutional. That's all institutional. The thing is that what Jesus replaces, instead of an institutional mindset about how we grow the structures of who we are, Jesus calls us to be missional. Jesus himself was missional. He understood himself as one who was sent by God to reach the lost, to reach those who were hurting, to reach those who needed to be saved. Jesus knew himself to be sent. And guess what? That was the primary identity he had for the disciples as well. He said, I send you to all the places where I am about to go. Two by two, he sent them. In Matthew, the end of Matthew, the end of the gospel, Jesus says, go into all the world, making disciples of all nations. In other gospels, it talks about how he has sent them into the world. Go into all the world that you might proclaim the gospel. This is from Mark. You know, God's mission for the church is that we are not a people who are called to come, to stay in one place. We are people who are called to go to all the places where God God would invite us into those new relationships with those who have been hurting and lost and abandoned, because those are those whom God has called us to reach. Too often, the church has got this whole thing backwards. Instead of recognizing ourselves as being a people who are sent, all of our activities are trying to figure out how to get people here. That's the exact opposite direction of what Jesus has called the church to be. Instead of a come and see, we're, we're called by Jesus to be a, a go and do, to go and connect, to go and love, to go and share. And it is only when we catch that missional mindset of Jesus that we see the growth of the church. I'm not sure if we're aware of this, but you realize in the first 300 years of the Christian church, there was not a single Christian building? Do you realize? Just let that sink in for a minute. For the first 300 years of the Christian church, there was not a Christian building. And the church has never grown faster when it didn't have a building. Why? Well, because we didn't have a trustees committee. That's why. <laughs> no, it's because we recognize that instead of spending our time and energy trying to figure out our finances and our facilities, we were spent our time trying to figure out how do we care for Frances and the neighborhood who's just lost her kid? And how do we help her know the love of God? How do we connect with that Roman soldier who, even though he just killed my brother, I want him to know of God's forgiveness. That is when the church is at its brightest, when it's living into the fullness of what God calls us to. And so Jesus, as he reminds us that we are that new wine for the world. We are that new garment that he has called us to be a part of. We are a party of God, a kingdom of God party that he has sent into the world that we might see and experience the fruit of the Spirit. As we close in this sermon, I want us to sing together something beautiful, something new. And as we sing that song, I want us to be reminded of the fact that God continues to call us to something new. Even though we may have had high points or golden ages in the past, we recognize that God continues to call us to embrace his work, something new, something fresh in our lives. Let us stand and sing together. As we continue in our time of worship, we have an opportunity to return to God our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. 
We recognize that all that we have has been a gift from God to us, and we have that opportunity to respond faithfully to God with all that he has given to us. And so I invite you to use the uh, ways of offering that are before you. If you're online, to go to the uh, Give tab on the website or mail in the offerings on the addresses that are listed. For those who are here, recognizing there is a basket in the back that we might use. But in the many ways that we continue to offer ourselves before God in Thanksgiving, I invite us to give thanks to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you again that you call us to something new. We've been striving on our own so many times in so many different ways to try to change our lives, to turn over a new leaf, to go in a new direction, but they all seem to be dead ends because we've missed out on you. But we recognize that you continue to pour out generously your blessing into our lives. And so we yield ourselves before you in all that we have that you might use us for your purpose and for your kingdom. And so, Lord, we would ask that you would receive this offering this day as a portion of all that we have and all that we are. That indeed we would be your faithful disciples in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us stand as we sing the doxology together. As we continue in our time of worship together, we have an opportunity to share our joys and concerns. Uh, for those of you who are online, I would invite you to mark that in the comments line as well. And as we continue to be in prayer, uh, we might say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uh, one thing I'll point out, just uh, somebody called me this week. Uh, there's an opportunity to house somebody who is a new refugee uh, in our town and uh, was looking for a bedroom to rent. And I just want to put that out there. If anyone has a place to rent, uh, please let me know because I'd like to help you get in contact with that person. Uh, so we, we look for housing for those who are in need. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Other joys and concerns we'd like to lift up together. Yes. Prayers for Maryland, who has just recognized a diagnosis for cancer. We pray for the Lord's healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I know we continue to hold up the Roy family, uh, recognizing the death last week of Peter Roy, uh, and for all who are deeply impacted by that occurrence of his suicide. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. so many adjustments and um, and the, it's affecting the kids the, the isolation and, and um, you know like you said it's like the, the family your spouse whatever in this um, in this time that we're getting on each other's nerves because <laughs> we're together so Indeed. And, and I feel like it's a Absolutely. Because their attitudes are not the same. They're yeah. not caring to yeah. learn like they used yeah. So we're lifting up concerns for our children in schools, as well as our teachers, for all who are uh, caring for that. We also want to, as a hearing, you know, the family dynamics, the recognizing the tensions that are involved there, and, uh, you know, this the isolation that's imposed as part of this, and even just the stress, generally, of the pandemic. Uh, so we lift this before the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayers. Other joys or concerns we'd like to lift up together. Yes.
Yeah, so lifting up concern and prayer for those who are giving care, uh, not only for those who are in need of care, but also those who extend themselves in caring for others. Uh, nurses, doctors, uh, house workers, uh, all that are involved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Other joys and concerns we'd want to lift up together? I invite us to join our hearts in prayer. God, again, as we come before you, we recognize the need that we have to come before you. Recognizing that you invite us to pray, not so that we can somehow feel good about ourselves or check off some sort of prayer list, but that in this time that we might meet you, that we might experience the connection with the power of your spirit, that we might hear your words of comfort, of wisdom, of guidance. And so we want to use this time to come before you with all that we have, that we would open our hearts and our minds before you. And so I invite us in this time of prayer, this time of silence that we will have together, to bring yourself before the Lord in prayer, to share openly before the God who loves you of all that's in your heart this day. Lord, I give you thanks that your spirit desires for us to come to you. That you are always ready for us to turn toward you, to return our hearts to you. And so God, as we've, we've shared many concerns in our community, the struggles that people are facing, both the physical healings that are needed, the stresses that people are facing, the relationships that are stressed, that in each of these, and even those that have been unspoken, that you're able to do even more than we could ever ask or imagine because of the power of your love. And this through Jesus Christ who teaches us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have one last song together. Lord, you give the Great Commission. I invite you to stand, or you might, and sing with us.
hearts and your minds to God, whatever way might be comfortable for you. And Lord, that you would pour out your spirit on all who hear these words, that we would know of your loving presence, of the fresh and new ways that you call us to be restored in you, that we might be your visible witness to all, that they might know of your love. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thank <laughs> you.